evening. Thank you all very much for being here and joining us for our very first ever event. I'm honored you could be here. Uh, I'm Ryan Neely. I am the president and co-founder of the MAPA Student Chapter here at Mizzou. Uh, tonight, first, I want to thank a number of people who have helped make this event possible. Uh, a number of them you've already heard from. Jason Lamb, Dan Knight, all of the MAPA board. Uh, thank you all for your work in prosecution, for what you continue to do to better the profession, for allowing our group to exist. Uh, thank you for giving us an opportunity as students to really grow our interest in prosecution every day in a meaningful way. We're very, very grateful for this opportunity. Uh, to our speaker this evening, Mr. McCullough, thank you very much for coming in and taking the time to join us and agreeing to answer questions. Uh, to our phenomenal advisor, Kate Bush, thank you for doing everything in the world that we've asked of you, for doing it with a smile, for not charging me rent for pretty much living in your office this past week. Thank you on behalf of every Mizzou Law student who has ever wanted to have a job. Uh, everything that we do here is better for you being here, so thank you very much. Uh, to Randy Watson, thank you for agreeing to be our secretary, taking notes even when I ramble in our meetings, and even as a busy 1L. To Sophie Mashburn, thank you for being one of the law students who is unshaken by math and accounting, which is very rare, and agreeing to be our treasurer. Uh, to Kayla Kemp, thank you for being my co-founder, vice president, wonderful human being, for putting up with all of my stress and doing pretty much everything I do aside from talking in the microphone. Those are our officers, by the way. They're up there. So if you ever have any questions about the organization, feel free to contact me or Kate or any of the other three of them. So our chapter exists to promote a dedication to public service and to create within the law school a culture of career prosecutors who are dedicated to making the profession a better place. We provide networking opportunities for students interested in prosecution by allowing them to speak with the MAPA board and attend MAPA conferences and trainings across the state. Members receive extensive access to events such as the MAPA conference going on this week in Columbia. So if you have any interest in joining that or participating in any of the events that the prosecutors do statewide, please let me know because that's one of the perks of being the member. And if you're interested in joining our organization, by the way, feel free at any time to contact me or Sophie, Randy, Kayla, or Kate at any time. We're always glad to talk to you about it and see what we can do to be better. Notice that we have the attention of the prosecutors in Missouri tonight at a time when it is more important than ever that we communicate within the profession. I hope that our event tonight shows that the people of Missouri are watching what we do and that it conveys the potential that this organization has to contribute to the law school. And to our future prosecutors in the audience tonight, I hope that this event serves as a reminder of the tremendous responsibility that we hope to take on on behalf of the citizens of Missouri. We hope to also serve the law school as a whole by continuing to bring in speakers with a variety of perspectives and promoting vigorous academic discussion within this building. Our goal is not to monopolize the dialogue or to present a single point of view as an absolute truth. It is instead to provide a vast variety of perspectives and the opportunity for vigorous debate. Our dues are $15 per year. If you join right now or between now and the end of the school year, that will carry on all the way through next May. So once again, if you're interested in signing up, talk to us. We also have some sheets in the back of the room, so feel free to just jot down your name and email address on the way out. I'd love to talk to you about it. Countless hours have gone into creating this very rare opportunity to engage someone with true firsthand knowledge on a topic of intense debate that has gone on in this building over the past year. Tonight's event is a truly unique and incredible opportunity. So I thank you for your passion and your interest in this challenging topic, because I'm excited for us to make the most of our time here tonight. Missouri's voters employ 115 elected prosecutors. Each are independently and autonomously tasked with representing the state of Missouri in all criminal charges that occur within their jurisdictions. The value that unite these brave men and women, honor, integrity, and accountability, depend on us. Our speaker tonight is at the center of a defining moment for our state. This is our unique opportunity as active citizens and future leaders within the legal community to engage him in a genuine and respectful discussion about the role that he was duly elected to serve. We're here tonight because we're aware that this is a difficult and defining time in our state's history. It is also more open to progress and innovation than any other time in my life. I believe that with the commitment and dedication of minds like those in the room tonight, with a collective willingness to tackle these enormous and difficult intellectual issues, together we can begin to make the system of criminal law better serve us. It begins with our duty as citizens of a democratic system, which requires first and foremost an active and informed population. So it's my honor to start that event off tonight by introducing our keynote speaker. Mr. McCullough has served as a prosecutor in Missouri since 1978. He's continued to serve St. Louis County as the elected prosecutor since 1991. We're all very glad for him to be here tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, St. Louis County Prosecuting right. Attorney, Mr. Bob McCullough. Thank you, Ryan. I appreciate that.
Well, thank you, and I hope the, uh, you probably have to turn that off, right? Um, I hope I can live up to, to half of what was said there. So I, I talked to Dan Knight earlier, and he said, what are you going to talk about tonight? So I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, my background. I was a prosecutor, how long I've been a prosecutor. I did this, I did that, you know, and I heard pretty much Dan just repeat it all when he got up here. So obviously he had nothing to say. So, so that's all been taken care of. Um, what I would like to do are, are really just a couple things. First of all, thank uh, the dean and the deans uh, for having me here, and, and Ryan and the MAPA uh, organization for, for allowing me or for inviting me and the rest of the board to come out and speak to the group tonight. It does mean a great deal, and I think as you go through law school, whatever year you happen to be in, the more exposure you can get to as many different aspects and areas of the law, the better off that you're going to be down the line, because it's going to take a while for you to figure out exactly what it is you want to do uh, when you go out to practice law someday. Some have a pretty good idea. Uh, some already know what they want to do, and that's, that's all well and good, but sometimes that doesn't work out either. You know, I, I would encourage everybody. Uh, I sure hope a lot of you will apply for jobs, to apply for jobs as prosecutors, um, and because we'd love to see an awful lot of just good, young, solid lawyers coming through the system there. I'll tell you the truth, I'm not real interested in hiring somebody who wants to come in for two or three years, try a few cases, and then go out and make a fortune, you know, uh, trying cases because you've learned how. You know, I'm not interested in training people to go out and be private lawyers. I am interested, though, and I don't expect everybody to stay forever, and I don't think anyone else does, but... But people who are dedicated to representing victims in cases, working with the victims, representing the people of the state of Missouri. There are some misconceptions about exactly what it is we do and who our client might be. You know, and strictly speaking, we don't have a client. You know, our client is that, that group that is the people of the state of Missouri who, in my case, happen to be in St. Louis County at any given moment. Not just residents, not just uh, people coming in there to work, but anybody passing through. And so that applies to everybody here in, in the various counties in which, they, uh, in which they are the prosecuting attorney. The law is the same across the state, but, <clears throat> but each, uh, each county will have a, uh, have a prosecutor. I would like to go through, when I, uh, I learned a number of things uh, going through this entire process in Ferguson. When I talk about a grand jury to you know, this group here, they know exactly what I'm talking about. When I talk about uh, how this happened or what we did and what that, they know what we're talking about. And it's all a shorthand version, and you'll figure that out as you go through your practice down the line. But it occurred to me that most people had absolutely no idea what I was talking about. You know, they, they've heard of a grand jury, and that applied to a lot of lawyers, uh, certainly a lot of law students and the general public uh, across the board almost. Because they've heard of a grand jury, but they really don't know what a grand jury is, what it does, where it comes from. You hear that nonsense about, of course, a prosecutor can indict a ham sandwich, that's all they're, you know, okay, fine. We'll talk about that a little later, you know, but at some point, the prosecutor's got to stand up in front of a jury and prove that ham sandwich actually committed a crime. Um, and so you can see just from that how silly that, that statement is. So let me run through, I'll, I'll go through a, a, a bit, and we'll leave plenty of time for questions. I hope there are a lot of questions, so I don't know if I'll talk for 30 minutes, but, but uh, that gives you more time for questions. Don't feel compelled to beat me until, you know, we get to 7 o'clock, but whatever questions you want to ask, fire away. Let me go through first the, uh, the grand jury process, uh, where a grand jury comes from, what they do, where that, uh, they get that authority to do that, and then we'll talk about this particular grand jury and what they were doing, why we proceeded in that particular fashion, and then a few other things, you know, some of the issues that really weren't uncovered as a result of what happened in Ferguson, but they came to light because of that. We've known about those for a lot of time. Now we'll, we'll, we'll jump on that later too. Now I think there will be the political will to actually do something about the issues that are there. I hope that, that, I hope that that's the situation because we don't, what we don't want to do is just have a lot of rhetoric and then stop and then move on, which is what we've done for so many years. Um, there's, there's an event, there's a lot of fallout from that event, there's a lot of talk about it, and then everybody goes back to their lives. So in this case, I, I hope that will is there to kind of make some significant changes to whatever it is we need to change in order to avoid situations like this. Now, I'm not naive enough to think that this will never, ever happen again. But I am 
confident enough to think that we can keep that to a minimum, to the situations in, in, in hopefully, hopefully never again, but we know that's not gonna be the case, but at least to the point where if and when <coughs> it does occur, we know what happened, we're able to figure out what happened and we're able to do as much as we can to even prevent those situations from arising. As any prosecutor will tell you, um, crime's never gonna go away, it's always gonna be there. What we hope to do is kind of keep that to a minimum, keep it down to the point where we have a, a society in which we can live and not have to worry about being able to walk down the street regardless of your situation, situation in life or situation in the community. So let me jump back to the, uh, to the grand jury. Now, this will change a little bit from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. First, not every county in the state of Missouri has a grand jury. Everyone's authorized to do that, but not uh, every county does have a grand jury. Um, in most of the, the counties with a, a significant population, there's at least one grand jury. And the process, the, the laws are the same, but the process, the procedure to go through in order to, to select a grand jury may vary slightly from one to the other. So I don't want anybody in this group jumping up and correcting me because you don't do it the way we do it. So what I'm gonna tell you is how it applies and how it works in St. Louis County. The grand jury is picked from the regular jury pool. In St. Louis County, that jury pool consists of anyone <coughs> who has a driver's license uh, or is a registered voter. They go into the magic computer uh, they're all in that computer, and that in, in St. Louis County, where we have a population of just over a million people, that's about 700, 725,000 people. From that pool, the computer spits out every week three or 400 names uh, to, to, and sends a summons out to those people to show up for jury duty. When they, and those are names that are selected randomly coming out of that. When they, uh, <clears throat> they show up for jury duty, either on a Monday or a Wednesday, because we'll do two pools of, of about 300 a week, almost every week, and then four times a year uh, from the, uh, or three times a year from that pool, once they're up in the jury room, uh, where they're probably, like I said, three, four, or 500 people, depending upon what the expectations are for that week, out of that group, randomly, will be selected somewhere between 25 and 50 of those jurors. They'll go down to whatever judge is assigned to handle the grand jury for that term. Uh, St. Louis County, we have one grand jury uh, always in session, and the terms, we have three terms a year. So in January, May, and September, we'll, we'll uh, start a new grand jury term. The judges just go right down the line. It started with Division I, Many years ago, I'm sure, and we go right through the line until you get back to one and start over again. That judge is in charge of the grand jury. That judge will then interview all the people that have been brought down out of the jury pool. And out of that jury pool, or out of that group, the judge will make a selection as to which 12 people are gonna be on the grand jury. What the judge is looking for there is, is that diversity. Diversity from across the county. St. Louis County is an enormous county, and not just, uh, not just with population, but it's about 550 or so square miles, most of which is uh, inhabited. We don't have too many wide open spaces in the county, so there are a lot of people there. So the judge is looking for people of all backgrounds, all walks of life, all ages, races, gender, inside the 270 loop, outside that loop, um, in the municipalities, of which we have 90, um, outside of the municipalities in the unincorporated areas, big munis, little munis. They're looking for all of that. And we end up with, or he ends up, she ends up with a grand jury, 12 people that, that fit that, uh, that entire dynamic, that entire demo, demography of, of representative of St. Louis County. Once that determination is made, the judge will then send the list over to my office. I have an attorney who's in charge of the grand jury. I put a different experienced attorney in charge of each term of the grand jury. So that attorney and the, uh, and the grand jury secretary will get that list. All we do at that point is make sure that we don't know anybody on the list, or if we do, we, we you know, have to do whatever is necessary on that. Rarely do we ever know anybody. Again, it's, it's a huge jurisdiction. So. And that's the first time that the prosecutor's office sees anything or has anything to do with the grand jury. 
That's about a week, maybe 10 days, two weeks before the grand jury is supposed to start its new session, its first session. So when they come over on that first day, that's the first time that we meet them. The judge will then come in and read their charge to them. Here are your responsibilities. It's about a seven or eight page document. It doesn't change from one grand jury to the next, but it kind of goes through. Here's what's expected of you. Here's what your responsibilities are. Here's what the prosecutor does. This is what you can do, uh, what we expect you to do, and on and on down the line. Their oath is in there, uh, and the other uh, prohibitions that they might have about revealing information they learn in the grand jury and the like are also read to them. So this is all presented to those grand jurors by the judge. And then we begin the uh, uh, presentation of cases. Not surprisingly, I hope, it starts off pretty slow. There are a handful of cases that first day that are not really complicated cases. A lot of drug cases, um, stealing cases, property crimes, just to kind of get them used to that. The grand jury is instructed on the law in each of these cases. Here's what has to be uh, the elements that have to exist in that crime in order for you to return a true bill. You explain to them the standard. The standard in the grand jury is probable cause. It's not beyond a reasonable doubt, but it's, you know, it's, is it more likely than not this is this, that a crime was committed and that this is the person who committed that crime? If that's their determination, then they return a true bill and the case moves into the circuit court uh, where it proceeds like any other case. Now, there are two ways for a case to get to that circuit court. Missouri can file a uh, complaint. The prosecutor files a complaint in the associate circuit court and has a preliminary hearing in front of a judge where you put on essentially the same thing, although there, there are probably more witnesses involved as opposed to, take that real quick, since that's not what we're here to talk about that much. We'll put on witnesses in front of, the, uh, uh, in front of an associate judge who will hear that case. It's the same standard, probable cause to believe that crime was committed and this is probably the guy who committed it. The judge makes that determination, it moves on to the circuit court. There's a defense attorney there, there's a judge there, of course. The rules of evidence kind of sort of apply, but not as thoroughly or not as strictly as they apply in the circuit court and a lot depends upon the particular judge involved. So that case then moves into the circuit court. <clears throat> the other with the grand jury is, they said the same thing, the, the standard is probable cause, the grand jury determines that, it goes into the same circuit court. They end up in the same place. Missouri, you have to do that. If there's, the case is either, there's either a preliminary hearing or there's an indictment returned by, or a true bill returned by the grand jury. So what I did years ago, <coughs> I've been, you know, I was an assistant prosecutor from 78 to 85, uh, and I've been the elected since 91. And what I did as the elected modified some of the stuff that was on there. But essentially what we do is we take all homicide cases to the grand jury. We take all sex offense cases uh, to the grand jury. We take all covert operations to the grand jury because if the cops got an undercover cop testifies in an open courtroom, he's not worth much after that. And we'll take other uh, situations. We have a defendant with five cases and one defendant will take all that to the grand jury at one time rather than do five preliminary hearings. Or we have three guys beat up another guy, we'll take all three of them to the grand jury at the same time. The grand jury's power is <clears throat> that they, ha they have the power to investigate and return indictments on all matter of crime in the state of Missouri. So it's not simply that their job is to listen to some evidence and decide if there's a charge that should be filed, they have the ability to investigate. Part of their charge uh, by the judge originally is, is just that. It tells them, that the judge tells them that, that they can call witnesses. Um, the prosecutor is there as their legal advisor. We'll prepare charges, we'll advise them on the law, we'll present witnesses to them, but if there are any witnesses they wanna see or hear, they can certainly let us know and do that. And, uh, and then we go out and get the witnesses and make sure that we bring them in to, uh, to present that evidence to the, uh, to the grand jurors. So in <clears throat> most of the situations, what happens is an offense occurs, something happens. The, the police do an investigation. When the police finish that investigation where they've examined witnesses, they gathered physical evidence, they've done this, they've done that, They'll bring that into our office and then say it's a homicide case. 
we will look it over and then make a determination as to whether we think there's sufficient evidence there to file a charge. If we do think that, then the charge is filed. The matter still goes to the grand jury. In that situation, what happens is, almost always, the, the investigating officer is the only witness who testifies, maybe another witness, but the officer will come in and say, here's what happened. You know, here's what this witness had to say. Uh, you know, the guy was shot three times. Here's where he got shot. The medical examiner said this, that, and the other thing, and then the determination is made. In some cases, and the one we're going to talk about, <coughs> the other way to do it, which is, which is rare, certainly not unheard of, but, but uh, not the usual situation, is to have the grand jury doing the investigation. That investigation is going on while the grand jury is hearing the evidence also. So we're bringing in witnesses, they're interrogating witnesses, the prosecutors are asking them questions, uh, <coughs> and we're presenting all the evidence to them. In this case, let me back up one other thing about the office. Um, I have one prosecutor on call 24 hours a day uh, just for homicide cases. So when a homicide occurs, that prosecutor gets the call, and that prosecutor will be the prosecutor, barring any other issues, who will handle that case from start to finish. I have another prosecutor, I think I mentioned earlier, that uh, handles the grand jury for that term, and that prosecutor will handle whatever comes to the grand jury for that particular term. So on August 9th of last year, my homicide prosecutor got a call that there was a, an officer involved shooting in Canfield Apartments in the city of Ferguson. She was uh, involved in that case then from the very start. And what we decided, I decided early on, was that this was going to be one, because there was an enormous, as, as I'm sure you know, enormous public interest in the case, interest to say the least. Uh, people wanted to know what happened. Within Within minutes um, of, of Michael Brown being shot, there were a dozen stories out there on social media, in the internet, being picked up by the meeting, media as to what happened. This is what happened. I saw it. This is what happened. At that point, nobody knew exactly what had happened. Uh, nobody, certainly in law enforcement, knew what had happened because there had been no investigation. So I decided early on that because of the, the public interest in that, because of the public unrest, because of the public's demanding to know everything that was in that, we were going to immediately start taking it to the grand jury and, and they would do the investigation. So to make a long story short, as short as I can, so you can ask some questions, is we presented <clears throat> any witness who had anything to say about the case. There were an awful lot of witnesses who said various things. Some were interviewed by the media, some interviewed by law enforcement, some interviewed by the FBI, some interviewed by the Justice Department, uh, <clears throat> and then uh, interviewed by who knows who else. But we brought all of that information to the grand jury uh, and presented it to them. So if witness A, <clears throat> I used numbers for him, so I'll do that. Witness 1 was interviewed by the media and by the FBI and by the county police, those statements were all played for the grand jury, and then the witness came in and testified. So the grand jury got to hear everything that particular witness said. We did the same for every other witness that, that came through the process that was there. We presented to the grand jury all of the physical evidence. There were three medical examiners who, who did autopsies in this case. Uh, all three of them came to the pretty much the identical conclusion. The only real issue was it's not even an issue is whether one of the entry wounds was an actual entry wound or a re-entry wound. Um, there was a shot that may have gone through Mr. Brown's arm and into his side, or it may have gone directly into his side, and this might have been a separate shot. And, and there were two, uh, two of the medical examiners thought one and one thought the other, and I don't recall which was which at this point. But that was the only uh, difference between the uh, examinations by the medical examiners. There were... <coughs> All the forensics that were gathered, um, the, the damage to the vehicle, the uh, DNA, blood, the, uh, the firearms examination, the shell casings were all recovered. Uh, the location of the shell casings became important in that. The location of blood uh, from Mr. Brown became important in, in establishing that. And so 
The whole idea was, as you would do in any case, is to look at the physical evidence, the hard physical evidence that doesn't change. That shell casing is a shell casing is a shell casing, and if it was fired in this weapon, it was fired in this weapon. And if it's, even though they bounce around a lot when they're ejected from the gun, if there are a number of them in this general vicinity and none over there, then there was nobody over there firing shots. If all those were fired in one, from one weapon, then there was one weapon involved and not several weapons involved. The blood is the same way. Blood on the street is not going to get up and move. So nobody can pick it up and take it from here to there. And so when you put all of that together and now you're looking at the statements that went along with everything with that, you compare that and you compare it as you would do in a jury trial. The reasonableness of the testimony and the statements of the witnesses compared to others, their ability to observe any interest, bias, or prejudice they may have, uh, their, their consistency with earlier statements they made, consistency with the physical evidence, and anything else that was there. There, there are a couple of, uh, actually a couple of <coughs> things I want to talk about. And one of them deals with the prosecutor's responsibility. There was a lot of talk, I'm sure you heard, that, um, that you know, the prosecutor's job is to present evidence and get an indictment. That's just wrong. That is not the prosecutor's responsibility. Could it have been done? We could have done that in a minute. I could have put on evidence that was just so skewered to one point, one way or the other, pick a charge or pick no charge. I could have put on one witness and come back with an indictment for murder in the first degree or second or manslaughter or nothing. I could have done that. But that's not what my responsibility is. My responsibility, as Mr. Knight mentioned earlier, all prosecutors, is to seek justice and find the truth. You know, even according to the ABA and the National District Attorneys Association, that we are ministers of justice. We don't have a specific client. Our responsibility is to the entire community and to determine what happened, to be able to present that evidence, to get to the truth so that a jury if need be, can make the determination as to what responsibility, if any, there is for a particular crime. <clears throat> as part of that, I have an obligation. I have an obligation by the courts, imposed by the courts, the ethical rules, uh, by the ABA standards, the National District Attorney standards, to present any evidence to a grand jury that may negate guilt or mitigate the level of the offense. And so when we put on evidence that, that didn't comport with some, what other witnesses were saying, you know, that was part of the obligation we have is to present that entire picture. It's not a whole lot different than if we went in and, and it was a, a uh, convenience store robbery where the, the, owner, the owner of the shop pulls out his own weapon, chases the guy out the front door, and all the witness sees is him shoot him as he's running away. Then I only put on that witness who says, hey, there's nothing going on. This guy's walking away, and this guy came out and walked up to him and shot him. Well, they're going to indict that guy, but my obligation would be to put on the fact that the guy had just robbed him, and now he's escaping, and, and, and we're going through that whole process. So that's the obligation that we have, is to, is to put on evidence that may mitigate or be evidence actually of actual innocence in the situation. One other, and I'll try to answer some of the questions as we go through, but one... <coughs> Another one was that we had uh, Darren Wilson testify. And you know some people thought that that was a terrible thing to do, that you're bringing the guy in. Let me tell you this. I would love to have the target of every investigation giving testimony in front of a grand jury. I would love that. I would love it on every case that I ever had to put the guy in front of a grand jury or to put him in front of a trial jury and ask the questions that you can ask them. Because what you get then is locked into a statement. Now what happens at a grand jury is most lawyers will say, you ain't going anywhere near that place. You will not testify. You want me as your lawyer, you're not testifying. And we know that. And you know, that's the advice I would give in most situations if I were on the other side of the fence. But in this case, he decided that uh, it was in his best interest, I suppose, for him to come in and testify. We we're more than happy to have him come in and testify as I would be with anybody else. Every trial I've ever been in, in front of a jury, the most disappointing part of that is that the defendant doesn't get up and take the stand. Because if you're a prosecutor, you can't wait 
to start asking questions of the defendant. You want to ask those questions. And if the guy doesn't testify, and in a trial, it's rare that they ever testify, you don't get a chance to do that. So any case in which we can get a defendant on the stand to get a sworn statement to say, here's what happened, because then we have the ability in that case or that witness to do what we do with every other witness. Take a look at what that witness had to say, compare that to whatever else he has had to say, and compare that to the physical evidence as it's out on the scene. Keeping in mind that neither he nor anybody else knew what the physical evidence showed. That was not something that was released to anybody. Nobody knew where this part, uh, bit of item or evidence was, where this was. They certainly didn't know where DNA was going to be, or where it was going to turn up. They didn't know where blood was going to turn up. They didn't know where the bullets or the shell casings were going to turn up. So it's difficult to tailor your testimony. Not impossible, I guess, in some situations, but difficult to tailor that testimony to the physical evidence if you don't know what the physical evidence is. And you compare that, again, to previous statements. In Wilson's case, uh, just like in Dorian Johnson's case, he had made numerous statements. He had been interviewed by the, uh, initially by the Ferguson police, I mean, very brief what happened, interviewed in more depth by the county police department, interviewed by the FBI, and I think interviewed, I think interviewed twice by the FBI, and then testified in front of the grand jury. So all of those things were, uh, were available to the grand jurors. One thing you have to keep in mind is that <clears throat> the 12 grand jurors are the only people, the only people on the face of this earth, the only 12 people on the face of this earth who heard every word of testimony, who saw every bit of physical evidence, who examined every photograph, uh, every shell casing, every weapon, only one weapon, the bullets, the DNA evidence they heard from the three medical examiners, they are the only 12 people on this earth that heard all of that information and all of that evidence. And these people poured their hearts and souls into this. You know, they were, they were drained when this was over and done with. They were drained and, and really ready to go when they came back, when they reached their decision. And, and we, <coughs> excuse me, made the announcement on that. So. I can't say enough about them, and then one other thing, and then we'll throw it open to questions. One, one other thing was that the cooperation between the local authorities and the federal authorities was unprecedented. It was, uh, and, and I think every prosecutor will tell you, that, that the feds and the locals don't always get along, uh, even prosecutors. You know, we don't always get along well with the U.S. attorney. We don't always play well, or I should say the FBI doesn't always play well with us. We're always willing to work with them, but, <laughs> but they don't always do that. And in this case, they could not have been better. They could not have done more. And they, they, they ran, Attorney General Holder announced early on that they were going to do a, I don't know his words exactly at this point, but concurrent but separate investigation while this is going. They would work with the local prosecutors, with the local police, um, and, and have the resources of the FBI, the United States Attorney's Office, and two attorneys from the Civil Rights Division, uh, two prosecutors. The criminal, the criminal division of the Civil Rights Division, which is probably not how they phrase it, but uh, <clears throat> who were handling their investigation. And so absolutely everything that we had, they had. Uh, there, there isn't a, a single thing that they had that we didn't have. There isn't a single thing that they had that we didn't have. Did I say that twice? Either one, I, we both had the identical thing. We all had the same photographs. We all had the same uh, physical evidence. We all had the same witness statements and the same witnesses. There were times when a witness may not want to be interviewed by the county police. And so the, the FBI went out and interviewed that witness. And then <clears throat> an hour later, we had that that witness's statement. Um, there were times when we'd find a witness and county police would interview that witness or one of my prosecutors would do that. Within an hour, the federal civil rights lawyers in the U.S. Attorney's Office had that, had that witness's statement. When we went out to get photographs, you know, whatever physical evidence we had, they had within a matter of minutes. Most of the time, they were, they were out working together. And then the same with the, uh, the medical examiner's reports. You know, when they, they, they brought in the Department of Defense chief medical pathologist and two assistants to perform their, uh, the, the, the Justice Department 
<coughs> post-mortem examination. We had that report as soon as it was completed. They had our report, the county report, as soon as it was completed. Even the testimony in the case, when, when a witness testified, if a witness testified on Monday, by Wednesday morning, the transcript of that testimony was in the hands of the Department of Justice. And so at the time the grand jury made their decision on November 24th, Absolutely all that evidence was, it was in their hands, was in the, in the uh, Justice Department's hands. <clears throat> when Mr. Holder made his announcement 101 days later, it was all the same evidence, the identical evidence that had been presented to that grand jury. So <clears throat> with that and the, uh, there's one other thing, it'll come to me in a second I hope. Well, if it does at some point while you're asking questions, I'll throw it out there too again. But I think the whole point we're trying to do with this is that there was so much misinformation, bad information out there that, you know, I'm thrilled that I get a chance now to do this, to come out and talk to people. And, and whether it changes your mind about anything, if you've got the idea that the cops were absolutely wrong and murdered this kid, or whether the cops were absolutely right and, and you know, did what they were supposed to do or somewhere in between, at least you have all the information and the availability now to ask questions to somebody who knows not as much as each grand juror did. That's the thing I want to tell you about is that it, with every witness, the grand jurors asked questions of those witnesses, every witness who came through there. They asked that certain photographs be taken. They wanted to see the perspective some witnesses had uh, when they testified. They said, well, I was in this particular spot and I saw this. You know, they wanted uh, photographs or something where they could see where that witness was and, and how it was. So we got all that information for them and provided all that with them. There were certain witnesses that they wanted to hear from. Dr. Bodden, who was the uh, pathologist for the family, was one of them. He was already on the list to be brought in, but they, they brought that up. So they were very involved in this, very engaged in this from the, from the very outset. So. Again, with that in mind, that they're the only 12 people who heard everything in this case, I'll argue with anybody who, who wants to say that this was somehow a scam and thrown in there and we just manipulated the whole thing. As I said on one of those TV shows the other night, the guy actually asked me the question, two questions. He said, well, you just, you just dumped all this information and evidence on this grand jury. I said, you know, how? How can you possibly criticize me for giving them evidence and information? Everything that we put in front of that grand jury, had there been an indictment, would have been admissible in a trial. Now, I wouldn't have been bringing it in, a lot of it. The defense would have brought it in, but there was nothing in front of that jury. And anybody who's ever tried a jury trial understands that that's the way evidence comes in. Juries don't, trial juries certainly don't have the ability to sit down and have a report drafted for them and then read what somebody else thinks of a witness. They're making that determination based upon what was presented to them, and nobody's ever complained about that. The only complaint we ever hear is that we didn't get enough information. So they had all of that information, all of that evidence. The other was that somehow I had managed to confuse them by doing that, and, and the response was, well, if I confuse the grand jury, then I confuse the entire United States Department of Justice, because they reviewed the identical information and came to the identical conclusion. And I only wish I was good enough to be able to confuse them that well, that easily. So having said that, I don't know how you're doing questions. I think you were. We've got, a, we've got two mics here, one over here and one over here. And I ask people to come down and get in line. And we'll just kind of go left, right, left, right. That's fine with me. Uh, right, Mr. Right. McCullough, thank you so much for coming here today. I really appreciate the opportunity to learn as a law student. I have a question more generally about the grand jury process. When you decide whether to charge homicide and give a case to the grand jury, what factors distinguish those cases from the ones where someone is killed but you don't necessarily charge homicide and give it to the grand jury? Well, if I understand your question, let me tell you how the process works, actually. When a case comes in, 
regardless of what ultimately happens with it, is reviewed by a prosecutor in the office. Now, and I and mentioned earlier, most of the time the investigation is completed before it comes into our office. We'll then review it and look it over and say, well, look, you need to go back and talk to this guy or find this witness and see what they've got to say. So we've got all that information and we'll make a decision. Now, in about 60 to 65 percent of the cases that are presented to us, we end up filing charges, which means in all right, whatever that number is, 35 to 40 percent, we don't file charges. So those never go anywhere. They don't go to a grand jury. They don't go to a preliminary hearing. What we're looking for, whether it's a homicide or any other case, is two things. One is, is there sufficient evidence here to, to believe this is, that a crime was committed and that he committed the crime? And is there sufficient evidence here to prove ultimately down the line beyond a reasonable doubt that this guy did it, whatever the charge happens to be? And if that, you know, it's not simply probable cause. That's what's necessary to get to the next stage. But, but our obligation, our responsibility, again, through ABA, the ethics rules, and everybody else, is that if we don't have a, at least a reasonable shot at proving beyond a reasonable doubt that this person committed the crime, then we're, we're, we're not, we shouldn't be, and don't file the charge at all. Thank you. Sure. All right. Um, so as law students, we're taught that once the juries hear something, you can't unring that bell. So regarding the outdated law that was initially presented to the grand jury, um, how did you remedy that? And looking back, do you think that you could have remedied, remedied that in a better manner? Yeah, and look at it that way. What did, is the, uh, the use of force, <coughs> and the problem was Tennessee versus Garner. Garner kind of defined it somewhat, and believe me, I'm by no means a constitutional scholar here, but I will tell you this, this is what we were dealing with. When that case was decided in 85, at first it was a civil case. And the civil case, whether it has relevance or whether it's applicable to criminal cases, is still up in the air. There's no case that has said, no Supreme Court case that has said, yes, it does apply to criminal cases. So in Missouri and in lots of other states, the, the Garner said this, and the statute said this. What happened in Missouri is the Supreme Court in Missouri Wrote, rewrote the criminal instruction to, to match Garner. And so in a, in a case where that is submitted to a jury, we're in a position of saying, do we follow the statute or do we go with the instruction? Well, we'd go with the instruction because not giving an, an MAI approved instruction is considered error immediately. It's just automatic error. So we'd go with that instruction, which is not what the statute says. So. Initially, the grand jurors were given that statute. Now, if our statute is defective, it's only defective because it doesn't go far enough. It's more incomplete than wrong. And there's nothing in the statute that is wrong. It's just not complete if you're looking at Garner. You go next door to Kansas, the Kansas Supreme Court has said Garner doesn't apply to criminal cases, so they don't pay any attention to it. So it's that, that was sort of the dilemma that we had at that point. So I suppose, what we probably would have done in the situation was give them the instruction, the, the, the MAI, Missouri approved instruction, on the use of force as opposed to giving them the statute and then giving them the instruction which is more detailed. Sure. Hi. Um, Hello. So you mentioned um, in the beginning that it would be naive of you to believe or think that something like this would not happen again and I'm Assuming that you were talking about the, unarmed, the killing of an unarmed black um, man by a white police officer. Um, well, I wouldn't be that I, specific. But oh, okay. Well, to, to I, think okay. That I'd be naive to think that the rest of the history of the world, no, no individual is going to be killed by a police officer. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, I guess so my question is because I'm from Ferguson, I am um, familiar with your history of failing to indict white police officers that kill um, unarmed black people, um, mm -hmm. including Earl Mary, who was a, the father of my really good friend back in 2000. Yeah. Um, what are you doing? Because you seem to have so much praise and accolades for the DOJ in finding that Darren Wilson um, acted justifiably, but you failed to mention what they found in their 100-something page report about the discriminatory Ferguson practices. Right. 
Um, what are you personally doing? Um, you talk about this rhetoric and, and things happening. Sure. What steps are you doing as the elected county prosecutor, since you like to throw that around, to ensure that the citizens and the constituents of St. Louis County um, are not being met with these, continue to be met with these discriminatory practices in the municipalities of St. Louis County? Okay, here's what we have been doing for years, and that's what I talked about earlier, saying I hope the political will now is there to do that. For years, we have tried to eliminate some of the municipalities, at least the municipal police departments, because they are terrible police departments. They're lousy. Ferguson wouldn't necessarily have been among that group because there's so many more. If you're from Ferguson, you can probably name half of them that are far worse than Ferguson in terms of the ability to provide effective law enforcement to the people of St. Louis County. So for the 24 years into 25 now that I've been the elected prosecutor, we have been trying to upgrade the, the quality of law enforcement that's out there, even if that means in some cases getting rid of the police officers, whether their license is revoked by the state of Missouri, running it through there, whether we can abolish the entire police department. As you've noticed, I'm sure in a number of situations, the St. Louis County Police Department has contracted with a number of the municipalities who had less than great police departments. And so now the county police you know, contracts with almost a dozen municipalities within St. Louis County to provide that, that, uh, that effective police uh, um, law enforcement. So that's what we've been doing for 24 years. And I talked about the political will there now. You know what's going on in Jeff City and everybody now talking about the municipal courts are terrible and they got this. That's not a shock to anybody who's been involved in this. You know, we've known all that. You have to keep in mind that we don't operate in the municipal courts. And those practices we don't do in the state court. And we don't, <coughs> those things aren't there. We don't raise revenue in the state courts. Years and years ago when I started in practice and, and the municipal courts weren't there to raise revenue. Now they've kind of become a revenue raising machine. So we've worked for the longest time, uh, unsuccessfully, I will give you that, to, to get rid of some of these police departments. You know, when we had a mayor of one of the municipalities by the airport, has got 800 people in it, who sent a letter to the police chief that said, hey, unless you guys start writing more tickets, um, you're going to be out of business. You know, you're not going to get a pay raise. You might not even get paid. So, it, well, we did what we could to, you know, to put them out of business, to, to get them to contract with a larger department where you can provide that stuff. So that political will isn't there. Now it may be there in order to do that. And so that's what we've been doing for 24 years. That's what I said earlier, why I hope that talk continues, why uh, the people who are working towards this so that we have effective law enforcement from one end of the county to the other. If you can't afford to provide law enforcement or the basic services to your citizens, then you shouldn't be a municipality. If you go back and check that record of mine, you'll see that I've been saying that for 24 years. Right, and so which begs the question then, obviously it's not working if it's been going on for 24 years. Yeah. So what are you going to do to make sure that well, we're, we're, we're not, what are you going to do next? We will keep doing what we've been doing. That's not now, working. But now that political will is there. Every day you will see people talking about combining or abolishing municipalities. Seven months ago, uh, you know, that was almost treason to talk about that. Now it's not. So, yeah, we got beat up pretty good, mentioning that many times, trying to do something about it, meeting with municipal officials to see if we could talk them into contracting with that. No, it wasn't working. It wasn't working because the political will wasn't there. Now it's there. That's why we've got to capitalize on that and get rid of these guys. Okay. Uh, I think you may have partially answered my question. Uh, it was, again, about the uh, municipalities. I'm a native of uh, South City. I had... Uh, it was... Um, I think a lot of the, you, you talked about there, uh, you have political will now to uh, sort of combine the municipalities or to at least maybe disincorporate them or take care of some of the issues. Um, what, I, I think my question more has to do with um, what causes them to persist? I mean, there's, uh, last summer I interned with uh, St. Charles County's prosecutor and driving from South City to St. Charles, I went through, I think, six or seven different municipalities within, well, if you count St. Louis City, then I went in probably sure. about a 10-mile stretch. 
why is there still support in, in these communities for what's essentially an ineffective system, especially now? Yeah. Well, you said yeah, you you said that now there's political will, but prior to this, I mean, these issues still persisted. Sure. There was still there was still these inefficiencies. We saw, I think, a few right. years ago, Bella Villa, right, and uh, St. George both had problems with hiring police officers with pass. And I say this as right. somebody with police in my family. You don't want bad officers there. So what? No, you don't. Kind of what allows. What allows it what to allows go on? What allows the people to keep going? Keep what going allows it to go on is that system. the people in that particular community don't want to do anything about it. They like having their local law enforcement, and in other communities, particularly on the north end, they don't have the ability to do something about it. And that's that's the problem. That's where that political will has to come in. You mentioned St. George. There was a whole slate of candidates in St. George who ran for office, and their ticket was, if elected, I will dissolve this municipality. They were all elected, and St. George got dissolved and went away, and they now are patrolled by St. Louis County. That's the sort of thing that has to happen. People have to get involved. You know, you have to get involved. People have to run for office. They have to recognize those problems. They have to recognize, come to the understanding, the conclusion that we can't afford to provide police services. We can't afford to provide this. We can't afford to provide all these things, so we're going to have to do something. That may be get rid of the police department. It may be dissolve as a municipality altogether. It may be merged with another municipality. But the people within those communities are going to have to do that. You know, and everybody else would be happy to help with that, but, but they got to do it. I don't have any problem with a municipality that can afford to do all that stuff. Be a municipality if you want. But, you know, you get uh, a couple of police departments that, you know, I, I'm going to tell you this. There are a couple of police departments that if nobody in that department showed up for work, it would be a better community. Uh, that's how bad a couple of these departments are. And I'm telling you, we've tried for years to get rid of that. But, I, you know, hopefully, and, and the big thing is money. It's the money. You control the police department, you control the money. We've kind of seen that, so. Thank you, sir. So there's, there's a belief that you aren't able to be unbiased when it comes to black black men being killed in, by a police officer, seeing as though your father was killed in the line of duty and you do have other family members who continue to work with the police department. So my question is, what are you doing to rebuild the trust in the black community for officer-involved shootings, especially when they involve black men? You know, part of that is I'm going to have to be out in the community more and you're going to have to help me with that. You know, there's, there's unfortunately that jump from my father was a police officer who was killed in the line of duty 50 years ago. And let me tell you how this got started, this, this rhetoric on that. There, there's absolutely no indication that I can't be fair and won't be fair. And every indication and all the evidence is that I am and have been. Is if you look at July the 5th of last summer, a month before Michael Brown was shot, a, an unarmed black man was shot and killed by a white police officer from Pine Lawn, a, a municipality that's one away from Ferguson. All right? You haven't heard about that, have you? No, and what happened in that case was is the chief in Pine Lawn at the time called the county police and said, will you come out and investigate this case? And knowing full well, they investigated, they're gonna bring it to my office. So the county police went out, they did the investigation, they brought it in, I and mean, this is a real long story, I'll make it real short. They brought it, <clears throat> excuse me, brought it into my office one of my investigators reviewed it, they're all retired police. One of my, uh, or two of my lawyers reviewed it, I reviewed it. We had them go back and do a lot more work on it because there was more to be done on this thing. They went back and did all that. We came back in, we looked at it, and the determination on that was, tragic as it was, it was a justified use of force in that situation. That result came out, now this happened the 5th of July, on the 9th of August is when Michael Brown was shot and killed, and this report was released in mid to late October of last year in the midst of Michael Brown going on. And yet nobody, not a single solitary person on the face of this earth questioned my ability to be fair in that situation. And the only difference I see between the two is that the attorney representing Michael Brown's family is, at the time, was the acting police superintendent for the city of Pine Lawn. So on one hand, on July 5th, 
He thought we were perfectly capable of conducting a fair and impartial and thorough investigation and a fair, impartial, and thorough review. And a month later, when he's representing the decedent's family, all of a sudden we can't be fair. So I'm sorry. I just well, because my question really was, how are you what are you doing to restore the faith in the black community? You kind of skated that and you said, well, well no, it, that's part well, of it. Go ahead. I'm sorry. So you, you said that it's up to us, and I am from Ferguson, Missouri, grew up there, yeah. and what are you do? like you said, it's up to us, but when the decision to not indict Darren Wilson right. came out, you did it in the middle of the night when riots had typically started, so I don't feel like that was something that would help restore the faith, so what sure. plans do you, what do you plan to do well, I, moving forward? I do need to get out in, into the community more than I have been over the years. And I've been out a lot in the community in that. And that, and that distrust just should not be there. Um, it, I mean, it shouldn't be there. If you look back at everything I'm saying, everything in my record shows that we've done fair, thorough, impartial investigations. I need to get out and start broadcasting that more as opposed to sitting back and taking it. Even with the, the lack of a diamond of five police officers in your 24 years? I'm sorry. Well, in your 24 years, there's been indictments brought against five police officers, and none of them have ever been indict no, that's indicted. Wrong. So there have been indictments against all more than 50 police officers over the years for everything from murder to stealing, sexual assault, all kinds of things. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Antonio Stanfield. I'm a 3O here at the University of Missouri School of Law. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you for your time and uh, to also recognize, you know, the courage that it takes to stand in front of a group of people and answer tough questions. Uh, with that being said, I have uh, my question has two parts. Uh, first, with respect to grand juries, um, you know, there's uh, this typical understanding amongst uh, many people that grand juries are shrouded in secrecy. Yeah. And uh, given uh, how you handled uh, the grand jury in the uh, Officer Wilson's case, uh, do you think that will likely spur some grand jury reform amongst Missouri state legislators? And uh, secondly, um, how often in grand juries does the prosecuting attorney uh, present both evidence that's beneficial to the state as well as evidence that uh, mitigates or um, kind of helps uh, the potential sure. defendant in that case? Sure. Uh, to the first part, I don't know what's going to happen in the legislature. We were down there earlier today uh, talking with some of them, and who knows what's going to come out of there. I don't know if there's no legislature. You know, nobody's related to any, and you, can, you can't repeat any of this, but we don't know what's going to happen. I suspect what will happen, what I did in this case, was that yes, grand juries are shrouded in secrecy, and they need to be, because there were a number of witnesses in this case in particular who would have come nowhere near this courthouse or the police or anybody else had they had to walk into a public courtroom and testify. And, and now they would have had to do that had there been an indictment come out and do that. And we explained that to all of them and that. So, but what we did in order to counter that somewhat is I wanted to make it all public, which is what we did. So as soon as the grand jury reached a decision, we released all the evidence that there was, all the testimony and put everything out there. That part is, most of the time there's not a record in the grand jury, and when there is, it generally doesn't get released. But I thought it was very important to put all that information out there so people could look at it and say, look, here's what happened. Whether that you know, becomes a standard, I don't know. We'll have to see, wait and see. I, you know, there's one, the scary thing is there's one proposal in Jeff City to abolish the grand jury. Um, and as the sponsor said, you know, why are we dealing with this antiquated system anymore? Well, I'm not realizing, of course, that he's part of the legislature, which is even more antiquated than grand jury. The legislatures have been around longer than grand juries, so that didn't seem to bother him any. So it would be a bad idea to get rid of them. But I think there are things that, that, that can be done, and we've got to wait and see what comes out of Jeff City. And then, I'm sorry, what was your second part? Um, the second part, um, well, basically, well, I'll just re repose it. Um, sure. Do you think justice is more likely to be achieved when uh, evidence um, that both beneficial to the state as well as to the defendant is presented uh, to sure. a grand jury to allow uh, yeah. the people to make that decision? I, I mean, I think that it is. That's why we present cases like that to the jury. I'd mentioned earlier that <clears throat> we have an obligation to present evidence, whether it's to a grand jury. I mean, as you know, I hope you know, there's in the grand jury, there's a prosecutor and there are the grand jurors. There's right. no judge, there's no defense attorney, mm -hmm. which is why we have the additional obligation in the grand jury of presenting evidence that we know of that may mitigate the degree of the offense or it may show actual innocence. So, 
yeah, I think it's a good idea to put that on there. You have to do that. Otherwise, you end up going to a trial, and then that evidence comes out at trial. And, and you know, I was actually at one law school where they said, well, no, you put on bad facts, and we're taught to hide bad facts. Hope you're not being taught that here. You don't hide no. bad facts. You just deal with them. So you put that out there, and I think, yes, the more information that, if you want to make a decision on something, on anything, the more information you have, the better off you are. And so as long as it's legally obtained and, it, and the proper foundation's laid and everything is there, as much information as you can give them is what they ought to get. Yeah. And, uh, it's a grand jury or a trial jury. Absolutely. Um, and last part, um, how often uh, in your office is uh, evidence of that manner uh, presented to the grand jury? Well, it's I'll back up just a little bit. Like my wife even says to me, you think everybody's guilty. <clears throat> well, what I say to her is, I think everybody I prosecute is guilty. Because if I don't think they're guilty, I don't prosecute them. So I mentioned earlier, the way we look at these things is we, in most situations, we review everything before it goes anywhere. And so if we look at that evidence, and if you look at this and say, well, here's the shopkeeper who was defending himself from a robber, and he shot and killed this guy, that evidence, that case isn't going to go anywhere. So I'm not going to present both sides to the grand jury, because I'm not going to present either side to the grand jury. So it's, it's in situations in which the grand jury is doing the investigation, which are few and far between. Uh, they certainly have that authority, but it's few and far between that we do that. So, and in those situations, yes, they get everything good, bad, and ugly. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so before my question, a few folks asked me as I was coming up if you could speak a little louder or into the mic. I know it sounds like your voice is a little hoarse. Sorry. I think the microphone's not getting to the back of the room. Um, now, you and Mr. Knight have both said that one of the nice powers of the prosecutor, you don't have to bring a case you don't want to bring. And so, well, no, I don't think either one of us said that, but go ahead. Well, you have the power to not bring a case and no one can make you bring it. Well, okay, fine. Okay. So my... So I didn't mean to get controversial preliminaries, but uh, so <laughs> the, the substantive question I have is after the grand jury present, heard all the evidence, and you yeah. were not in the room the whole time, but your folks were in there, the prosecutors were Correct. there with the grand jurors, do you believe that it would have been in the public interest for Darren Wilson to be indicted? And if not, why even allow the grand jury to consider bringing an indictment that you don't think should have been brought if no one can make you bring a case that you don't want to bring? You know, if only life were that simple. No, I don't think it would have been right based on all the evidence as we know it now and we knew it by the end of the grand jury presentation. It would not have been right to present or, or for them to have returned a true bill on that or for us to have filed a charge. But you keep in mind, as I said several times now, this is an investigation that's ongoing as we're presenting the evidence. You know, we, there were times with some witnesses, you don't know exactly what they're going to say or which version they're going to give and some who gave different versions until they're sitting right there and say it. And so we don't necessarily have all that information. That's what we would have under other circumstances when the investigation is completed and then it's brought to us. And then we look at it and say, there's nothing here. There's, there's no chargeable case here. Uh, if you look at what the feds did, that's, that's exactly what the feds did. They looked at all the evidence and said, there's no chargeable case here, so we're not going to present it to a grand jury. We didn't have that luxury. I thought it was much more important to get that information to the grand jury so that I can get it to the public sooner if there is no indictment. So I think maybe my, I, I might not have spoken clearly. I mean, at the end, after the grand jury had seen all the evidence, you presented yeah. all the evidence, if you believed at that time that it would not have been appropriate for the grand jury to return a true bill, why yeah. not recommend that to the grand jury, come out, stand up in front of the public, and say, instead of saying, I gave it to the 12 of them, and they did what they did, say, I'm the one who got elected to make hard decisions, an indictment wasn't appropriate. That's the recommendation I made. I've been around a long time. If you don't like it, hire somebody else. Well, again, I'm not, I'm not a politician, right? so I'm not running for anything. I, I wouldn't win. I'm not running either. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not running either. So, you know, it's, again, it's just not that simple. It's, it's you've presented all this evidence. It's like going up to a, to a jury and saying, you're presenting all the evidence to a jury and saying, I think he's guilty, so we don't need you anymore. He's guilty. Or we, the defense attorney saying he's not guilty, so we don't need you anymore. Once it's submitted to the grand jury, then they're making the decision. They have the information. They're going to make the decision on what's presented to them. They do that in every case. So they'll make that determination. We've already looked at some cases which never go to them when it's very clear, especially, that, uh, that there shouldn't be an indictment. But at that point, 
you know, of course, I can't say. I didn't see every bit I have since then, but not every bit of evidence that they saw, and, and, and I hadn't heard all the witnesses or sat there and watched them testify. But no, uh, that would have been just wrong to put Did this grand jury. You never recommends to a grand jury that it not return a true bill? That they not return one? Correct. Because it's my understanding that the guidelines for prosecutors from the ABA and the National District Attorneys Association say, if you don't think there should be an indictment, you should recommend that the grand jury not indict. Well, if you don't think there should be an indictment, you shouldn't be presenting it in the first place. That's the, I mean, that's the real step. You're, you're kind of jumping a step there. If you look at that and say, there shouldn't be an indictment in this case based on all the evidence, then you don't even present it. In this case, we didn't have the luxury of looking at all the evidence before it was being presented. And that was the decision I made because I thought it was much more important to get things started so that the public knew that, you know, we're at least working on this thing. Thank you. Sure. Um, my question applies to you, but maybe also sort of to some of the other prosecutors in the room. Um, so thinking of judicial ethics, the code of judicial ethics and model rules and whatnot, um, judges are, they seem sort of similar to prosecutors in the, uh, in the context of they get cases that they don't necessarily get to choose um, and they kind of just have to uphold the law in a relatively neutral way. Um, they're not allowed to sort of put their own, or they're not supposed to put their own opinions into these cases that they hear. Um, but unlike uh, prosecutors, judges are uh, subject to sort of a higher standard, ethical standard, in terms of cases that they um, could or should recuse themselves from based on any hint of bias or impropriety. Um, so in your opinion, especially given some of the personal criticisms that have been made against you, um, in, in dealing with the Ferguson case. Do you think that prosecutors should be subject to a higher standard, um, eth ethical standard, I guess, in terms of recusing themselves from certain cases? Well, I'm not sure what the higher standard you'd, you're talking about would be. I mean, right now, if, <clears throat> if there is a conflict, then you recuse yourself. I mean, right. it's pretty I mean, simple. I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, <clears throat> sort of that additional, I think of it as an additional standard, I guess, um, in that judges are supposed to uh, recuse themselves if there's even a hint of bias or impropriety. You know, bias or impropriety, and, and it, no, I, I don't think judges fall into that category either. If there's an actual conflict, you know, the, the appearance of impropriety is, I guess, what you're getting at there, and that's really not even a standard anymore. If there's an actual conflict, whether it's a judge or a prosecutor, then you recuse yourself, and I've done that before. Um, and in fact, these guys don't know it yet, but I have one in my car waiting to pass on to somebody because I have a conflict. So yeah, now I'm gonna do it to Lomar as he's not here. So when there's a conflict, and, 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 and here's what I've done. In, in a couple cases involving the police, for example, there was a, the son of an officer whom I know very well, still do and knew, we worked a lot of cases together, we're friends, we'd socialize together, and his son was involved in a very serious situation and it would not have been proper for me to do, I had a conflict there. I couldn't look at that and say, I'm gonna be as fair as I should be on this case because I know this kid and I know his father very well. And so I recused myself and it went to another prosecutor. And that's what you do. Now, when you start recusing yourself because you know what, there are a lot of people yelling at me and a lot of people who think you know, that I ought to go somewhere else and a lot of people who are you know, making a lot of noise about it, you know, then you might as well quit and go somewhere else because I got elected, as every prosecutor does, they get elected to handle these cases and it came up. If there's a problem, then I recuse myself. If there's not, then I don't do it. And so recusing myself, that never entered my mind on this particular case. And again, there was that quantum leap that was being made from your father was a police officer killed in 50 years ago and you can't be fair. And there's a whole lot in between, and yet nobody could cite anything in between there to indicate that one was connected to the other. So, no, I don't think anybody, I think it's a very high standard as it is, that if you've got a conflict, then you recuse yourself. And there's always the, you know, if, if, if a prosecutor doesn't do that, then there are ways to do that. You know, the, the uh, judge can recuse you, you know, they, they can... They can appoint a different prosecutor, you know, if, that's a, if there's a real conflict there but they've got to make a finding that there is a real conflict, not just somebody's yelling at you. Geez, if I walked away from a case every time somebody yelled at me, I'd, I wouldn't have a whole lot to do. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right, we'll move here, and I 
think we've got enough people in line. We're going to go to a few minutes before seven. So let's, let's try to work our way through the people standing. Go for it. Next. I'll be quick then. Um, you said earlier that you enjoyed speaking to us because we actually knew what a grand jury was and what it kind of did. Um, and I think this goes towards Kayla's question about rebuilding ties with the African American community. Mm -hmm. um, but how is your department working to make the whole prosecution process on all of its levels from uh, choosing to press charges in the first place all the way through whether you decide a case goes to grand jury, all the way through who you decide gets the death penalty. How are you making that transparent and accountable for your local community? How are you making that available for people yeah. so that way they can know what a grand jury is and so it's not just sure. the people here in this room? Well, then, because there got to be a lot more rooms like this all throughout the community, throughout the state. And so the more of those I <clears throat> can go to, and I talk to the community a lot, but I think it has to be more detailed. You know, I generally go out, and I, I will tell you that I go out and I'll talk to them about a particular case or about uh, trends or something like that. But I think it is much more important that, as like I said, it's, regardless of what your profession is, you know what you're talking about, and you just assume everybody you're talking to knows what you mean. So I think that's what I have to do, and the rest of us. You know, we've worked an awful lot over the years on best practices, on <clears throat> trying to be much more involved in the community, getting them in, educating the community on the uh, criminal justice system. And in all honesty, you know, up to the last few years, we haven't done a very good job of that. And we just kind of went about our business. And I think that's something that we do have to do. We've got to get out in the community and do that. So they know how the system works. And a follow-up question to that, are there any resources available for the community to either look up online or someplace readily available for people who don't know how to do massive amounts of research to figure out how you guys come to decisions about pressing charges and grand juries, et cetera? You know, there's probably nothing online that would tell you how we did that, but um, you can certainly go online and see what cases have been filed and, and, and all that, but it, I don't know. I, I, I'll be honest with you, I don't know. We've got some publications out, sort of, don't we, about here's how the process works, but at the same time, one good way to do it is to come sit in a courtroom sometime and see how it works. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thank you. Um, so it's known that the police office and the prosecutor's office work very closely together. Um, in fact, sorry, <laughs> in fact, in St. Louis City last uh, summer, a um, police officer beat up a man and had it covered up by a prosecutor by saying that the man resisted arrest. So with that backdrop, given the, like, the knowledge that there is a close relationship there, wouldn't uh, justice require that a special prosecutor be appointed in these situations where um, there are charges being brought against a police officer? You know, I've, I've heard that question once or twice, and the question, if you didn't hear it, is <clears throat> because of the relationship between police and prosecutors, should there be a special prosecutor appointed when the, the, uh, the, the charges or the complaints lodge against a police officer, right? State Basically, that right? yes. Okay. The problem with that is who's going to be the special prosecutor? I mean, I, I feel like one can be a point. Like maybe that's not something that's known right now. Yeah, but that, well, that's where the problem comes in is that <clears throat> there have been suggestions and proposals in Jefferson City that if a prosecutor um, has a case where a police officer is accused of beating somebody or shooting somebody, Everything from a, a prosecutor from an adjoining county becomes automatically the special prosecutor because that prosecutor doesn't have the relationship with that police department. But of course that prosecutor's got the relationship with his home police department. So that doesn't quite fit into that. So go across, the, wherever you go, if you're gonna get a prosecutor to come in and do it, it's going to be the, uh, the prosecutor is going to have that same working relationship, which is what it is. It's a working relationship. The police don't work for me, and I don't work for them, and we're independent. Just like I don't work for the judges, they don't work for me. We don't always agree on things. So, but we do work closely together with judges and prosecutors. You know? So uh, there's just nobody who, can, who would come in and do that. Even taking it to the attorney general. You know, the current attorney general was a prosecutor in Cass County for 10 years. As the uh, uh, attorney general, he's got a criminal division that's what? How many lawyers in there, prosecutors in there? 22. 22. So the attorney general doesn't have, and, and they prosecute cases all over the state. So you make that same argument about them. And then in my case, what happens if, I don't know, say I get elected attorney general next year, then I get them all. 
Right. So, which is probably not what people want. So here, here's, the, here's what you have to look at is, I'm a lawyer. So not surprisingly, I know a lot of lawyers. And yet I prosecuted lawyers throughout my career. When they do something wrong, I prosecute them. I'm a prosecutor, so I know prosecutors, lots of them. And I've prosecuted prosecutors before, state and federal. Uh, you know, so where do you do it? It's, it? The issue is whether there's a conflict there, whether there's a, there's a real legitimate conflict there, and not someone just saying, I don't think you can be fair, so move on. So to piggyback off of your original answer by responding with the question of who would do that, would you say theoretically it sounds like a good idea if we could find some sort of like unbiased person? Well, as a good prosecutor, I don't ask their answer theoretical or <laughs> hypothetical questions. <clears throat> but I'm not, you couldn't find somebody. So you get a criminal defense lawyer to do it to be a prosecutor. We'll see how that's going in the municipalities. Would you say that it would be better if... Um, it was handled federally then, as opposed to- Well, this thing. was handled federally. Okay. I, I, I just, there's, there's no easy answer to that. I mean that, the entire process, not, I mean like the grand well, jury Well, they, they process, did their entire, not. the feds did their entire <laughs> process, and they did their independent, they examined all the physical evidence themselves. They didn't take our word for it. They re-examined right. all the physical evidence. They re-examined all the DNA and all the blood and the firearm stuff. So they did their own examination and came to the same conclusion. So, you know, there's, it's just at some point. Well, no, I don't mean for this specific case. I mean, uh, like, f for cases in the future, like, going forward. Yeah. I'm not saying that your office did anything wrong. I'm just saying, given that relationship, yeah. would it be better to have somebody else handle those cases? Uh, you know, I don't think so, because unless you can come up with a, some alternative. Okay, thank you. Sure. Sure. First, I have a statement. It's, it's, uh, I'm glad to see all the board for MAPA here, and I hope that you all are going to be petitioning the legislature to uh, allow for greater reentry of ex-offenders who are disproportionately disenfranchised in your county who can't serve on grand juries or juries, um, and overcoming some of the restitution barriers that Mr. Lamb fought for with the Pew crew folks came in for the criminal justice reform to get actually more folks who look like Michael Brown on grand juries and in juries. That's the first thing. I think that'd be great for you guys to actually come out and make a stand on that for ex-offender re-entry and reintegration. The second thing would be, you talked about the probable cause standard for the grand jury, and then you're thinking about beyond a reasonable doubt, and yet you all are taking multiple pleas, over 95% of pleas, and not recommending a charge that could have been met that was below the standard of homicide or murder in which Mr. Wilson actually might have pled, in which you do consistently on a daily basis for other defendants. And so the question is, knowing full well that most of your cases don't get to trial and don't get to that jury trial and that you're going to offer a plea why didn't you record why didn't you recommend a charge and say full well we know this is going to satisfy this and then the last piece about your evidence about the folks who talk to media how often do you really get somebody says someone makes a, a a statement in a traumatic moment and use that against them and say guess what what you said at that traumatic moment we're going to use that against you now to discredit a witness for us as opposed to the defense Fine, you're probably going to have to remind me of all those questions I'll, again. I'll, I'll try. try to go Let's through them. Okay. I, I think it's on video. We got the transcript? <laughs> <laughs> we can release that transcript. No, my bad. The first one, you're wrong. All right? With, you know, with everything, you can't just charge somebody to be charging them. You know, and just say, well, wait a minute. Here's what I'm going to do. I can charge you with murder in the first degree, and you're facing the death penalty. But I'll tell you what. How about, I know you didn't commit a crime, but I'm going to charge you with manslaughter and you plead to that and take a five-year sentence and I'll take this death penalty off the table. That's just absolutely wrong. I ought to get indicted if I did something like that and should go to prison for it. You don't do that sort of stuff. If I don't think the guy's guilty, I don't charge a guy. If we have a guy in a courtroom, he is found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. We don't amend the charges down. Some cases that charge goes down, but not often. I mean, I don't know where you're getting your, your well, facts. When you accept a plea, do you say, do you say to the defendant, we can prove this beyond a reasonable doubt. Yes. Here's what I can prove. And the judge makes a fine. You ever been in a courtroom, Professor? Yeah, and you, you, don't, you don't barter away your charges? No. OK. Uh, you know, it, it's, what, what I find curious is that there's a range in that continuum from the, the actual murder itself to assault to negligent homicide, the whole range of things that could have been charged, to which you recommend on a daily basis. Keep charges, in mind, right? this grand jury had murder first degree, murder second degree, manslaughter, voluntary, and involuntary manslaughter. They had all that, that entire range. Now. When you have a, a 
deceased individual, it's kind of hard to come up with some of them other than a homicide situation, I suppose, but, but I, I'm just telling you this. No, we don't. We charge the case that we can prove beyond a reasonable doubt. And when a defendant walks into a courtroom, professor, and stands there with his lawyer, professor, and says, yes, I did this. Yeah, I, we've got a professor, we got that. But Fine, is it no, 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 don't interrupt me on this. Let me finish this part now. The judge goes through an entire litany of questions to this guy sure. and then asks him all these questions. Did you do this? Did you do that? You heard what the prosecutor just said he can prove beyond a reasonable doubt. And that term, by the way, is included in my statement of facts. That's what I can prove beyond a reasonable doubt. They go through an entire litany of all the rights this guy's given up of everything he's given up and the fact that this is what he said and you heard that, yes, and you agree with that, that's what you did, substantially correct, yes, fine. Then I find you guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. You know, we don't yeah, just walk yeah, that, in that and I say... Have no, I'd have no problem with that, but you well, said yourself, you talking though, about the probable cause is the standard to meet and then you're thinking about this went down the... This seems to be putting the cart before the horse. Right? You're meeting, you can meet the threshold, the probable cause. And I think that's what the sort of the... If the that's all you can meet, then you have no business prosecuting that case. I know what it takes to prove a case in court. And if I can't prove it, I can't charge it. Okay. All right. Last question. I'll keep mine quick. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, I just want to first by start by thanking you for being here. Uh, given the, high, the benefit of hindsight for everything you've seen, heard, done mm -hmm. after all of this, uh, what would you have done differently uh, handling the grand jury in this case? Man, couldn't that have been the last question over here? <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's really hard to say because here's, here's what we got. We will be looking at this, and we've already been doing that, and dissecting it and picking it apart and pulling it out, as you would on any major case, and saying, what could we have done differently to have avoided this? you know, or, or to handle it something in this way. So we're really not at the point now where we can look back and say that. I, I tell you, major things I would not have changed. I would not change what I decided to do, and that was start presenting the evidence to the grand jury and having them, investigators were going along, because I think it was just too critical in the public view to, to, to make it go on. I mean, what would have happened is it would have gone on until the end of the year or close to that. You know, this was November 24th, when the uh, grand jury finished their work, it would have gone on at least that long until the investigation was finished, and then it would have taken us a while to examine all that, make a decision. In the meantime, things are not going well. I mean, it, it, there was a lot of dissension. So I wouldn't change that at all. I thought it was very important to get that out there. I certainly wouldn't change releasing the information. Maybe the manner in which it was done, um, I, you know, I would have been more thorough about it, uh, but. <clears throat> because we apparently missed a stack of statements um, in, our, in our rush, because I wanted it released as soon as the grand jury made their determination. So, so I missed a stack of statements that, were, that, were, uh, that weren't released immediately. They were subsequently released, but so all that was out there. But it's something we're going to be picking apart for years to see what we can do better and how we can do it. I think the biggest thing right now I mentioned to a couple is that you know, to get out and explain to the community how the criminal justice system works. I think that's the biggest problem we have, and, and we're starting to figure that out, is that people don't know how something works, then they distrust it. That's just an automatic. But there's an awful lot of work that, that's got to be done. The cops have got to get out on the street more. They got to be more involved in the community so people know who they are. You know, and it's a two-way street. You know, there's a, there's a lot of things that go on that, that, uh, that we've got to address. Thank you. Sure.